Hello and welcome to the Ship Shape Podcast, a series of podcasts where we meet amazing people and talk about their experiences, personal, technical, and all related to the maritime world. Come and dive in, dive in. Welcome, everybody. You're tuning into the Ship Shape Podcast. This is Talha Bhatti, and with me, I have Mel Shrat. And today, we have a very special guest, a uh, fellow live aboard, and his name is Andrew Bardoni. He's, uh, I've only met him recently, but I, I imagine he's been doing uh, a lot of this marine stuff for a while. He's very hands-on. He's involved in a lot of projects, and uh, let's, let's hear it from him. Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome to the show. Thank hey, you guys. for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, like like Tala mentioned, I, I'm uh, a liveaboard. Obviously, that's what the show's kind of tailored to. But probably a little bit different than most liveaboards in the sense that I, I like to get real hands on, and I'm pretty much tore my boat to pieces and, and rebuilding it the way I want it. So outside of that, I'm a civil engineer by trade, trying to shift into 100% sailing around the world by trade. So that's that's one of the things I'm working on at the moment. Yeah, thanks thanks for having me, guys. So Andrew, you know, obviously knowing your bio, you were a correctional deputy, and then you took some zigs and zags, and then you ended up doing civil engineering. So how exactly did you get into boating? Did you grow up sailing? Were you raised on a boat? What's the story behind that? No, no. My so growing up, I had only been on out sailing one time in my life. Uh, it was in Santa Barbara and my, my grandparents took me out on a whale watching kind of cruise, I guess you would call it a cruise, on a big old giant catamaran. And I remember absolutely loving it. I remember laying out on the net and just falling in love with being out at sea. And I didn't really ever go sailing since then. I just kind of forgot about it, but it always kind of stuck in the back of my head a little bit. It wasn't until I moved out here to Norfolk after uh finishing my degree that I decided I, I need to, to pursue this this selling lifestyle. So I took a class like most people that have no clue about selling do. It was like a, it was one of those uh, ASA Killboat 100 entry courses and I was I was absolutely hooked. I got out on the water and I, I figured out real quick that this is exactly where I need to be. So here I am. Was it the, the community that, that got you? Was it being on the water? I mean, really what kind of, what was the mentality that you were having that you're like, okay, this is a good decision? So it, it was definitely being out in the water. Uh, it was the feeling of freedom and, and knowing that like you, you can hop on a sailboat and there are no limits. You can take off tomorrow and just go as far as you want. That's what really drew me in, the, the independence of it. The community was a bonus. As I started to get to know people and started to figure out what the the sailing family is like, or just the, the boating family in general, it's a tight community, especially with liveaboards. We all kind of look out for each other. It's very social on one end, and it's very antisocial. I don't know if that's the right word. Very <laughs> solitude on the other end. You know, we love to get together and, and be together, but at the same time, we'll all disappear every once in a while. And I think that's part of the the sailboat lifestyle we're all we all can be we're, we're all introverts i think mm. but not so much when it comes to our own type of people and you're right is that there's definitely a certain sort of wavelength everybody has sort of you know crossed some bridge to end up on a boat and uh you know made, made life choices you know that enable that so with regards to some of the sacrifices you had to make you know and people obviously have to cross bridges to end up on a boat but like just in terms of lifestyle changes and maybe even minimalism, because that's a big part of boating and living on a boat, especially. How did you adjust and adapt to all of that? So with minimalism, I, I never really saw that as a sacrifice. I saw that as more of a pro to the to the whole situation. When I was a sheriff's deputy, I did, you know, the normal American lifestyle. I had the home. I had all the stuff, you know, spent tons of money. And when I decided to leave that, go back to school, I sold everything, sold the house, sold all my possessions. And when I was doing that, I started realizing like all the crap that I actually had, things that were just stored away and I hadn't even seen in years. And I thought, why do I even own this? 
So in that aspect, the minimalism thing totally appealed to me. I was like, I never want to go down that road again. And I tried to really take that to an extreme where I said to myself, if, if I don't use it once a week, I don't need to own it. I'd love to even go further than that and say, if I don't use it once a day, I don't need to own it. But that's pretty tough. So that, that I liked. So I, I had to sacrifice, I guess, the normal American mentality of, of how you should live life. And that, that can be difficult, especially when it comes to meeting other people because it's it's abnormal. It's not what most people want to do. It's kind of pushing against everything. So like even your your normal dating life or just, you know, thinking, okay, I would love to meet somebody and I still would love to have a, a life partner. And that becomes a little bit difficult because I, I think people have this, this idea that, oh, you got a boat, you must have, you know, women are just falling over each other. <laughs> and that's not really the case. I mean, maybe certain okay. types of women, Maybe maybe we just got an old too. <laughs> maybe that's it too. Yeah. Maybe that ship has sailed. Um, yeah. But I think I think the the reaction I get most of the time is it's people think, oh, that's a dream. That sounds amazing. You're out of your mind. I could never do that because mm -hmm. most people want the white picket fence and the 2.5 children and the ni nice nest egg, and they don't want to leave very far from their family. Mm -hmm. So that's I feel is definitely been a sacrifice. You narrow the pool of people that think on your wavelength really quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel you on that one. How old are you anyway, Andrew? Uh, I just turned 40 this year. 40. Yeah, I'm getting older. Not too old for it, right? New no. At 40. So do you enjoy it then overall? Like, is it is it something you'd recommend to other people? I, I, I recommend it if it is, you have to really, really love it because it's not an easy lifestyle. And, and so you're, you're talking about like living aboard completely, right? Yeah. I mean, anybody can have a boat and kind of just go out for a, a week and sail every once in a while. That's not really that hard. Um, but to, to take, go, take it to the next level and live on the boat, you better really be in love with it because it's a love-hate relationship. If the, the love for the lifestyle doesn't trump the hate, You'll, you can you, you'll never do it. It's just it's almost an obsession. But then yeah. describe it. Tell us tell us more about it. what do you mean? What what is this love hate relationship? So I wake up every morning and the first thing I think about is my boat. And <laughs> usually when at work when I'm at work I'm thinking yeah. about my boat. I'm thinking about my boat. I love it. And when yeah. I come home every day I'm working on my boat. It's almost like having a child. Mm. In fact, I, don't, I mean I've never I don't have kids, so I can't say this for sure. But I think maybe sometimes this is harder than having a child mm. because it always needs your attention. And it can sink at any given moment. And it's a whole lot more expensive. <laughs> well, uh, on my on my dating app, I say I don't have a dog or a child. I just have a boat. Yeah, mm, literally, lots of responsibility. But is is that it then? Is that the sort of love hate part of it? it the hatred part is just the responsibility attached to it or no even that I don't, I don't hey i don't know if i've really found anything that i i hate about it there's things that are definitely challenging but like i said like you have to it has to almost be an obsession like you have to love it otherwise you, you probably won't be able to do it so are you afraid of sharks no so hmm. so i i grew up in california and we, we frequented our summers going to a, a little town called Pismo, Pismo Beach, which is on the central coastline. And we'd swim all day long in the water. Pismo Beach is known to be one of the largest great white breeding areas in the world. It's where they go to, to mate every season. So swimming in the water with unknown whatever was a frequent occurrence from a very young age. So uh, I never was really afraid of that. I'll, I'll swim in just about anything except my marina <laughs> but i look at it more as a statistics thing and that's how i approach a lot of things in life uh you're, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than to get eaten by a shark in the in the ocean so i figure you know i drive to work every day the odds are i'll get in a car accident and die that way not swimming around in the water or not sailing or doing any of the things that i really love Interesting. Well, I'm sure I need to work on on my swimming form because I probably look like a wounded seal. On her. <laughs> that's that's what they're attracted to. You just can't flop. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. So then, how does one sort of like even the f fear of sailing? Like lots of people are just like afraid of like being out there on a boat. Like how does one overcome a fear like that? Just I think it? it's all how you approach it. I, I think if that's the case, 
then approach it as a challenge to get over. You know, I, I don't love heights. Sometimes going for, I mean, going for a hike on top of a mountain, you get to that, that cliff edge or just climbing on my mast. It's not my favorite thing to do, but it's not going to stop me. And it's something that I feel like the more I do it, the more it'll be less, I'll be less fearful of it. And that kind of, that kind of goes with anything in life. The more you do it, it, it won't be as scary unless you just have like a, a mental phobia. And then, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you then. You got the, you got the boat. So what is your dream adventure with the boat? What are you planning on doing? I mean, it's not even a dream. It's, it's the reality of what I am going to do. And that's, I'm going to start selling all over the world. The goal, the short-term goal right now, and I don't try to set too many long-term goals as far as where I want to go. Kind of like it to be just where I feel like going at the time. But I do know to kind of kick it off, uh, I plan on this fall heading south and down to Florida and then cutting across the Bahamas and maybe spending a year or two just island hopping down the Bahamas, the Caribbean. I think one of the, the big goals, and I don't know when I'll do it, is I'd like to sell up past the Arctic Circle. All the way. We yeah. know uh, one of our friends did that. He recently got hit by a train, though. Oh, wow. So there you <laughs> yeah. go. There you go. Yeah. Careful what you wish for. Yeah. Not yep. up past the Arctic Circle, though, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> no, it happened in Boston, unfortunately. Yeah, um, yeah it sucks. But at least he did it. At least he, that's that's pretty awesome accomplishment. Yep, not yep. not I mean, very many people sell up that far. Exactly. He's one of the first few individuals in the world or something. Yeah. Um, it's a small number of people. So, so tell us, so what sort of, I mean, you, you've you only been doing this a few years, but what sort of, just keeping your dream adventure in mind, uh, how, how are you planning towards it? What sort of advice would you give to somebody who wants to do something like that, sail the world? Uh, so the, make sure you, your boat is ready. That's the, the, the number one. There's, there's certain things that you should have on a boat to what do you mean not only that? make so break that so, down. Though. So there's certain systems on your boat just to make, I mean, Obviously, there is danger involved in anything you do. So you can do things to reduce that amount of danger. For me personally, I want to have autopilot on the boat. I want to have a, a, a good navigation system on the boat. Beyond that, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I'm super adamant about being off grid because it's not cheap to go down and live in the Bahamas. If you've got to stay at a marina or mm -hmm. even Florida for that matter, it costs a fortune to stay at marinas down there. So I'm, trying i'm equipping my boat so that i don't ever have to stay in a marina if i don't want to so that's right. a big part of it save a little at least some kind of bankroll just to have in case something happens plan on trying to make money while you're doing it but just take the plunge and do it uh you'll always think of a thousand reasons not to and usually all those reasons will keep you from doing it it's kind of just takes saying okay i'm going and just doing it so getting to you know your whole experience with getting a boat how exactly did you find a boat you know what were the you know did you go on yacht world did you do a lot of research how'd you find it so i was i don't know i might be a little bit different i mean obviously I, everybody gets on yacht world and looks at all the boats to kind of get an idea of prices i guess for me so i i did what a lot of people do when they think they might be in a sailing and you start you start watching youtube videos of these pretty cool people out there that are actually living the dream they're going out there and they're doing it and that that was one of the things that kind of inspired me i was like well if they can do it why the hell can't i hmm. and through doing that i fell in love with a specific boat and i thought that thing's awesome it can handle just about anything you throw at it it's not insanely huge so you can solo hand so i knew the exact boat that i wanted going into it that made it a little bit tougher, I think, because this boat, there's not thousands of them out there. It's not a Beneteau. It's not a Juneau. So I, I got on Facebook and I put out a, a message. I said, hey, this is the boat I'm looking for. If anybody knows anybody that's selling one, shoot me a message. And I immediately got a response. This guy was like, hey, my buddy's got one. He's not looking to sell it, but you might talk to him. So I called that. I called him up. I said, you know, this is, I got your name from a friend of yours. He said, you've got this boat. Do you ever think about selling it? He said, yeah, maybe. He said, it's it's been sitting on my driveway on the hard for about six years now. And I hate to see it just sit there. Why don't you come up and look at it? So it was up in uh, Cape Cod. So I drove up. We hit it off. He really just wanted to know that his boat was going to go to somebody that would love it as much as he did. 
and he wanted to see his belt get used. Mm. So he, he sold it to me and uh, it was pretty easy. I've grown up pretty mechanically inclined. So, and I, I did a lot of research as to what you kind of want to look for on a new boat. And so I didn't get a survey because I didn't really want to deal with that. And I've, I've heard from people that the survey is a good thing to have, but a lot of surveyors will really just tear boats apart, even if there's not a whole lot wrong with them, just to kind of validate why you're giving them 500 bucks. Hmm. So I didn't go that route and I don't regret it. This boat is about as solid as a boat as you could ask for. And what, what boat is it? What year and stuff? I've got a, a 1973 Pearson P36. Interesting. And so why, obviously lots of people, I mean, it's a, it's a personal choice thing, but lots of people go for older boats as, as you have. Um, what's the thought process there? So the, the reason I was drawn towards older boats, and I, I talked to a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of old sailors that have been doing it a long time, and they, they kind of pointed me in that direction. The era of boat building during the early to mid 70s was an early era for fiberglass use. And they built boat builders, loved fiberglass, but they didn't know the effects of longevity of fiberglass in the water. So they built the hell out of it. They, they built the holes about as thick as you'll ever see. I mean, my hole is almost one inch thick, pure fiberglass. So they just built them like tanks because they were like, well, we think it'll work fine. We're not sure. Just put a thousand percent on whatever it, we think it might be. And then we know it'll last forever. So they built these air of boats just to be as strong as you could possibly ask for. And so as the years went on, then did they start like removing layers, basically realizing that it, they were going to last for thousands of years? Yeah, they like kind of any, I mean, it's, you can compare it to a vehicle. If you look at a car that was built in the fifties and it's indestructible, and you look at a, modern day car and most of it's plastic so they mm. they figured out okay what is the the bare minimum to increase our profit margins that we have to build these boats at so you look at a modern day boat like you know nothing against Benito. i'm sure there's people out there that have them they're beautiful boats but the holes are a lot thinner on them mm. so to me that's i'm sure they're fine they'll probably last just as long as my boat but i have this i have the feeling of the comfort of knowing that this boat will last a lot longer than i'll be around mm. True. When you were looking at boats, you know, you said that you knew what to look for. What were you looking for? So there were several things because I knew I wanted to sell this boat around the world. Uh, one, I, I had to have a, a kill step mass. That was crucial. And what that means is there's two types of mass. There's deck step, there's kill step. A deck step will sit on top of the deck of the boat. Sometimes there's a tension pole underneath to kind of take some of the, the weight of the mass and some of the, the pressure, the, the downward pressure. A kill step mass goes through the deck and it sits directly on top of the kill. So it's just a lot beefier. It's a lot more solid. The displacement is a little bit better, just stronger in general. Most blue water boats are made with a, a keel step mast. Uh, the other thing I was looking for was a certain type of keel. Uh, I either wanted a monohull or I wanted a fin keel and I wanted a nice deep draft. Uh, the draft is how basically how deep your keel goes down underneath the boat. So this boat has a, a fin keel with a six foot deep draft, which is a lot. There's pros and cons to it. It's got nice displacement. So I'm pretty confident that this boat would never capsize. It might tip over, but it'll probably ride itself immediately just because there's so much weight underneath the boat. The mm -hmm. con is it's six foot deep. So there's a lot of shallow areas, especially down in the Bahamas, down in Florida. You're limited on some of those the areas that you can get to just because of how deep it is. Are you a, um, a fin uh, spade rudder or are you a skeg rudder? I've got a skeg rudder, so and it's protected. So that was another you thing that I really like. all these storms around. What are you guys talking about? So uh, the spade rudder is like a, uh, the rudder comes through the underneath. It's just kind of like a, a free flowing, unprotected, right? Where the, the skeg is a part of the hull kind of comes alongside it to protect it from any damage. You know, I've heard, I've heard tons of stories of, of people losing their spade rudder because they, they run into some object. The skeg rudder is just like an extra layer of like a fiberglass guard, essentially, that protects the rudder from any type of damage that you could run into. I mean, either either case, it'd be, you, it would be hard to tear your rudder off, I think, because it's typically your keels right in front of it. If you're going to hit something, it's probably going to be with your keel first. But there are cases, yeah, where 
your keel misses it and it just rips your rudder off. It's nice having the skeg. I, that's again, I don't, a lot in modern boats aren't built with the skeg rudder. They're built with spade rudder and it's less expensive to build them that way. When you first got your boat, what problems did you face initially when you first got it? Like what repairs did you have to do? Was there anything? So I didn't really have any problems. There was definitely jobs that I wanted to tackle right away. So I didn't even put her in the water when I first got her. I had her trucked down. Uh, the mast was already dropped. So I thought, well, I can go up to Cape Cod. I can step the mast. The rigging had been down. I mean, l- like I said, it had been sitting on his driveway for about six years. So I didn't feel like it was, made, it was really a great idea to re-step the mast, put all the rigging up, and then sail it down from Cape Cod to Norfolk. If I was going to have any problems, that's, that's a decent distance hmm. through some not-so-great waters. So I trucked her down. I immediately put her on the hard, and I spent the first six months redoing the entire bottom. So I sanded it down completely. I replaced all the through holes below the water line because they were, originally they were all bronze through holes. Bronze is nice. Old bronze, not so much. It, it'll kind of turn a, a pinkish color, and that's when you know the, the bronze is kind of starting to go bad. It becomes very brittle at that point. So I just pulled them all, replaced them with new through holes, repainted the bottom. And then while I was doing that, I replaced all of the standing rigging on the entire boat. Mm. And I even, uh, the backstay and the two upper shrouds, I, I upped it one size, knowing that it, it's going to take an awful lot to to take this mass down. I, I, w- I would have to have some major hurricane winds to snap one of these rigs. That must have been, so a, uh, all that. That must have been a pretty good uh, price tag. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, I did it all myself. So uh, that saved me a lot of money. Uh, I'd say uh, maybe about five grand to redo all the rigging, all the standing rigging, and redo the bottom. So it wasn't horrible. If I'd hired somebody to do it, it probably would have cost double that. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, on a good day. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And so, but going back for a sec, to, you were telling us about like what uh, you made you decide on this boat. What other factors were there that made this a blue water friendly boat? Uh, those were the main things: the the keel and the the mast. I mean, that's she's a, she's a, got a really wide beam, which I like. She's got a twelve foot beam. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the living space? The water line the room or like stuff like that, or we were just not even concerned about stuff like that. I mean, I liked how open the layout was, but that was more for like a living factor, not so much as far as how to accomplish sailing around the world. Because mm-hmm. my, I mean, on any boat. I was probably going to almost gut the interior anyways and make it how I wanted it, which is kind of what I've started. I've been doing on this boat. I cut back a lot of bunks. I opened the whole uh, main cabin. So it's big, wide, open, spacious. Some sailors, especially some of the more traditional sailors, tell me I'm crazy. Like, what the hell are you going to hang on to if this boat's healed over 30 degrees? But I've done things to kind of compensate for that as well. But yeah, I I wanted to make sure that she was a solid boat that could handle just about any situation. Mm -hmm. So those were the, the, the two main areas that I wanted to make sure that I had. What were some of the major projects that you've done already on the boat? I heard that you were kind of changing up the whole interior and kind of building it from scratch. What have you done? So, so far, I, I completely I completely gutted the, the head, which is the bathroom on a boat, down to the, the hall, tore out all the cabinets, the toilet, everything. It was just an empty shell when I was done with it. So I rebuilt all the cabinetry in there. Uh, I installed a new toilet, an all-electric a mastering toilet, getting ready to work on the shower. The It's a wet bath, so I'm getting ready to work on the shower right now. This last winter, I installed a wood-burning stove in the, the main cabin area, which I absolutely love. Getting ready to build a new freezer box and install a new refrigerator. Gosh, what else have I done? It <laughs> seems like it's never ending. Gonna re- been redoing the entire electrical system as I've been going. Redid all the plumbing when I tore the toilet out, tore out all the old sanitation hose, replaced that with all new. Yeah, it's, I mean, the list is just, it's long. And, and this is the list of stuff that's already happened. And then you, you also have some future plans, uh, incorporating solar, maybe swapping out your engine, I heard. Yeah, yeah, I've got some, some major projects in the future. So I'm, I'm definitely here in the next couple months when I have a solar arch made. I mean, I, I like to do everything myself, but when it comes to welding stainless, I want it to look nice, so I'm not going to do that. And then install solar panels. I want to put a large battery bank on the boat because the future goal, I don't know when this will happen. It'll be 
probably a few years down the line is to to pull the diesel motor out and replace that with an electric motor nice yeah that that's part of my 100 percent off-grid process which will include fuel yep basically then you're producing your own fuel if you had enough solar yeah i mean granted i would still have to get fuel for the d but i don't look at that any different than having to go in and get groceries you don't have to be at a marina to do that i can ding in and get whatever i need and isn't that becoming more mainstream like isn't one on one of these youtube celebrity types also testing out an electric powered solar thing out in the middle of nowhere yeah yeah uh selling uma is a big one and they've they are is that what they've been yeah they they stripped out that was the first thing they did when they and we we actually have the same boat there's just one year older than mine they've been a lot of the inspiration for what i'm doing I, i i've been seeing what they've achieved which a lot of people told them initially you're out of your minds and i'm seeing them do it and i'm just like okay well again if they can do it why can't i so yeah they've been a huge inspiration for all this interesting so how long have you actually owned the boat for it'll be two years this november i know time starts to lose meaning when you're on a boat yeah yeah days i'm really bad about remembering even what day of the week it is anymore (laughs) um you yeah, kind of get I more people into this shift, guys. <laughs> yeah, you start shifting more into seasons, not really yeah, days true. and weeks. True. But so in in those few years then like you've obviously already had some sailing adventures. What's what's been your funnest sailing adventure so far? Oh gosh. Um so I think a real fun one was last the last 4th of July, me and a couple family members sailed up the Elizabeth River and anchored out at a little pl- little area called hospital point and watched the fireworks over norfolk city that was that was pretty amazing really enjoyed that done a lot of kit trips up to cape charles those are always fun and so what what makes for a good day of sailing then uh you want good wind but not too much wind so 10 to 15 knots is, is perfect it's comfortable you're, you're usually hitting your haul speed at that point but you're not out there heeled over 30 degrees the whole time the waves aren't too choppy good weather on a hot day it's not too fun i was at last july i was doing the cape charles race and we had no wind that day and it was hotter than hell that wasn't fun i didn't enjoy that but would but, any of those sailing days make like a top five moment for you so it depends like top five like good sailing top days. five ex- yeah. exciting <laughs> Okay, the categories. Well, I mean, however you want to take that, you tell me. So, I, I, so if, I'm, if we're talking like excitement, there, yeah, I can think of a handful. So, me and a couple buddies attempted to sell up to Annapolis this this year, this last year for the Annapolis Boat Show, and we've been planning this trip for I don't know about a month. We knew we were going, and we were planning for two days to get up to Annapolis, fart around in Annapolis for the day, and then a couple of days to get back. And we got hit with this pretty good storm uh, the weekend that we were leaving. And we were still determined. We were like, no, we're, we're doing this. We got to go. We've only got a couple of days to get up there. Hmm. So we left. It was a Sunday morning. And I remember when we left, there was a few people that were poking their heads out there, their cockpits, looking at us like, where the hell are you going? Are you out of your minds? And we, we get out on the bay and it's it's blowing 30 and we're hitting, we, we got a good three meter waves just oh boy. slamming against us. Three meter. Yeah, it was not fun. I mean, it was just beating the hell out of the boat. So the first day we made it as far as Hampton, which if if you know the Norfolk area, Hampton's about a 20 minute drive from Norfolk. So we got out, we were like this is insane. And we got back in as fast as we could. And we did that for three days. Just <laughs> fought, fought it, fought it. Mm. And it, it was not fun. The waves were erratic. It was like you had to just be fully concentrated the entire time because their waves were just coming from everywhere. And we made it as far up as Reedville, which is right on the York River. And we we said, well, there's no way we're going to make it to Annapolis. So if we still want to go to the boat show, we've got to turn around and head back. And then we'll drive up to the boat show. So we turned mm-hmm. around and made it back to Norfolk in about six hours. And it was one of the most beautiful sailing days I've ever had. Mm. On the way back, where you weren't fighting everything yeah. down. So the, everything had calmed down by then. And it was like, this is perfect. Why couldn't we have had this the last three days? Mm. 
Nice. But that's selling. That, that's if if you try to to sell on a schedule, you'll always lose. And who and was this on your boat or was this on somebody else's? No, no, this one was on my buddy's boat. Okay, okay. And have you had the boat long enough to like have this one project that you, you know, maybe it was like the the most expensive or the biggest or you know what what would that be? Probably the the bottom. Doing the bottom is the most expensive so far. The electrical system that's pretty pricey. I've bought most of what I need, other than the batteries to redo the entire electrical system on the boat. The batteries are going to be a lot. Those lithium batteries aren't cheap, so mm, I'm probably going to buy those. Yeah, I'll buy those probably four at a time until I get my my 12 kb battery bank. Nice. Okay. This show was sponsored by ShipShape.pro. Ahoy there! We are ShipShape.pro, the national directory of marine repair and refit. We hope to be a valuable resource for all your boat or yacht repair needs. Your struggle to find the best marine service ends here with us. We provide you access to the largest database of marine service providers across the U.S. Whether you are looking for electricians, engine mechanics, welders, detailers, divers, or any other general contractors, our easy-to-navigate categories help you save time and effort in finding the best service provider for the job, wherever you may be. Look us up at www.shipshape.pro or send us an email at info at shipshape.pro. We would love to hear from you. Welcome back to the Ship Shape Podcast. So, um, have you taken out a lot of people that don't know anything about sailing? Have you taken out friends, and, and how were their reactions to bringing people out on the water? I know from my experience, you know, I would invite people, you know, thinking that everyone would come out on the boat, and then once you have the boat, no one ends up uh, actually coming out. Or maybe I'm just weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've definitely taken people out sailing. It's not fun though. <laughs> I, I I don't really enjoy it. Usually, it's just I mean, when you take somebody out that's never been sailing, they have no clue what they're doing, and so you end up doing a lot of work, which I don't mind. I I actually enjoy solo sailing. I think it's a lot of fun. But solo sailing is a whole lot less work than taking out a handful of people that have never been on a boat before. Because they just get in the way, and you're worried about somebody falling over. It's stressful. Yeah, they bring stuff usually with them that you shouldn't bring on a boat. <laughs> like high heels. What, what are some of those things to avoid bringing on a boat? Uh, there's a couple things. Like one, you don't bring red wine on a boat. Mm, that, that's, that's a, a big one. no. You don't bring. This is one that kind of is a pet peeve of mine, and I don't know if anybody else has ever noticed before, but Cheetos. Don't bring Cheetos on a boat because that orange dust that you get all over your fingers, it stains everything. Mm, who would have thought? But red wine's the worst. Because mm. somebody will spread, spill red wine and it will stain your hull, your, your deck. Yeah, yeah, and boats are white. Yeah, there's been uh, plenty of times where we've waxed a boats and I guess now that I think about it, it wasn't rust stains. It could have been Cheeto stains. Yeah, probably. <laughs> little kid finger cheeto stains andrew what sort of so you've had good experiences bad experiences maybe tell us some like strange weird experiences that you didn't expect you'd have like did you see have you seen new ufos i don't know i haven't seen any ufos i'd love to i have seen bioluminescence even here in the Ooh. chesapeake bay tell us more about that what, what was that like i've heard it's beautiful it is it's awesome and i'll tell you where i saw it wasn't out on the water Hmm. Like out sailing, you see that nice glow behind the boat as the, the motors turn in. I saw it in my buddy's toilet when I flushed it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Little swirlies came go, came flushing down the toilet. That's the only time I've seen bio, bioluminescence here. Okay. Uh, what else? Weird things that I've seen. Not so much weird, but a lot of beautiful, pretty sea life. I've seen uh, loggerhead turtles out here in the bay. I mean, dolphins. 
I don't know, 100 times. I haven't seen a whale yet, but I've heard they come out here in the bay sometimes. Yeah, but you do experience weird things on a boat, like things that I had never even thought about before. I, I remember, so my first summer living here on the boat, you hear noises on the bottom of your hall. Mm. And it really freaked me out the first time I heard it. I thought, oh my God, I've got a leak somewhere. This is what's going on. Because So there's there's two things you'll hear, uh, that at least that I've heard. One, you'll hear like a small crackling sound. And I guess after asking around and Googling it, is it's like a, a small shrimp that's feeding on the bottom of your boat. It's eating the algae. Oh boy. And you could hear yeah. the small shrimp feeding on the outside. Yeah, it's like a little, like it sounds like uh, Rice Krispies in, in your wow. milk. Uh, and then the other crack. thing I heard, mm. and I thought, yeah, my boat's sinking for sure, is this, uh, I was laying there at, at night one night, and I hear this loud gurgle, like air rolling up the hull. Mm. And what it is, is it's, as the hot day, as the temperature's changing, the silt and mud under the water are le- mm. releasing big air bubbles. Wow. And I've been told it, it's sometimes, it's even like a... Uh, like methane gases. Mm. So you'll hear that come up and hit the bottom of your hull and roll up. And if you don't know what it is, you'll, you're convinced that your boat's sinking. Mm. In Boston Harbor, we have all these like tankers that come through these huge tankers and they go right by uh, the boat. And in the beginning I could hear this, like, you know, it did, it sounded like water was coming into the boat. So I'd be like crawling across the teak floor, you know, trying to figure out where the hell it was coming from in a panic, like sweating. And uh, it took me a little bit of time to realize that I was hearing the propeller of these gigantic tankers that were coming by and it would just oh yeah through the water and just echo inside the boat. Yeah, sound travels pretty far underwater. Mm-hmm. I guess you know, now that I'm thinking about it too, one really cool thing I've seen on a couple occasions. One, I was on, I was up the Elizabeth River and I was in a, a not my boat. I was in a little like a twenty foot oh what do they call it? a Harbor Twenty just out racing around on the Elizabeth and I look over and about 20 feet from me was a nuclear submarine just slinking by that that was pretty wild and then all of a sudden all the patrol boats around it were yelling at me and maintained 500 yards and or 500 feet sorry and then on on another occasion I was selling to Cape Charles and I had just crossed the the channel I mean just had crossed it minutes by and the entire naval fleet was coming in right behind me. So that was pretty neat. And it was, you know, a couple of crit carriers, a bunch of battleships, nuclear submarine. I mean, if I had been five minutes slower, I would have had to turn around and go back. I would have never made it across the channel, but that was pretty neat to see. That's one thing about living in Norfolk. You'll see a lot of big naval ships. You, can probably you guys might hear it right now. They're, they play <laughs> cadence every night. So, Andrew, so you've done this enough where maybe you, again, you can like, you, you've given us tips about what to look for in a boat, but like once once you've got it, like how do you survive on one? Especially again, like a bunch of years, keeping your dreams intact to see the rest of the world while sailing. Mm-hmm. How do you do it? Uh, learn to sacrifice. Hmm. Uh, sacrifice. I mean, welcome, unless, welcome sacrifice. So, I mean, unless you're buying a brand new boat, like if you're buying a boat that you plan on working on and making it your own, you're going to have to sacrifice some some creature habits. I mean, I spent, I don't know, three months pissing off the side of my boat because I didn't have a toilet installed yet. Mm. And I, you know, if I had to do anything else, I had to go up to the marina bathroom. So, you know, there's certain creature habits that you, you might enjoy living on land that you probably won't have. I mean, obviously the toilets, not you got to have a toilet on a boat, but there's other things that internet's always kind of an issue. You probably won't have the best internet living on a boat. So get used to having slow Wi-Fi. Gosh, what else? The, the weather is an issue. Unless you, you have means to stay warm and you're in a cold area, you're going to get cold. If you don't like rocking to sleep every night. <laughs> I have an issue. Although, I, I wanted it. to ask you about that previously. Yeah, is that lots of people describe the sleep in, they've gotten in a boat as the best sleep they've ever gotten. Is that true for you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the first three months that I lived on the boat, I was really tired all the time because it's quite lethargic. You know, you're just that gentle rock back and forth all the time. Now I don't even feel it. And same with in reverse. I remember the first couple months living on the boat and going out sailing. When you get off the boat, you, you mm. can feel you, you got your land legs and you can kind of like, well, yeah. wobbly. That for maybe not for everybody, but for me, that that went away. Okay. And how, how soon was that for you? A few weeks? A few well, months? A couple months, probably. Okay. Yeah. When, uh, when I first started living on a boat, I was still in law school. So I would go to the class and I sat in the back because I was a bad student and I would look at the board I'd look at my screen and everything was wavy I was like oh my god what the hell's going on 
So I type into WebMD. I was like just on a boat and now on land and everything's like my visuals are wavy. And, you know, of course, WebMD tells me that I have this chronic disease that I'll have for the rest of my life. You're you know? having a stroke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but any, any other survival tips, though? So I guess just always plan for something. You know, like one of the things that I've, I've spent some time doing before this winter and I still need to do a bit more is building like my my foul weather gear mm-hmm. because I like sailing all seasons. I want to go out when it's cold. And if you don't have good foul weather gear, you're just going to be miserable. You're going to be cold. Mm-hmm. You're going to be wet. Stuff like that. Have items like everybody should have a ditch bag and I've been building mine. And what that is, is just like the worst happens and you've got to get off the boat, leave her behind. You need a bag that has stuff to sustain you while you're doing that. That's important. And I tried to do that just not only in that scenario, but any scenario. I've got, you know, certain items that I know I want to have. If, excuse my French shit hits the fan. And as you said, you can't be looking for those items while the shit is hitting the fan. You have to be prepared. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're living in probably the least hospitable environment, aside from maybe living in, I don't know. Mars. Yeah. Mars or Tibet. Like... The ocean doesn't like people, really. doesn't like things that people make. It's always fighting against you. So you, you have to kind of prepare for that environment. It's not a happy environment where it's saying, yeah, come enjoy life on me. No, it's like, well, you don't belong here. Like, you're, like, you're a land animal. What are you doing out here? Okay. So keeping that in mind then, actually, I was going to go to Worst Storms Resort. Do you want to go into Worst Storms again? Is it a different story than going yeah. to Baltimore? Or maybe no, the- Going up to Annapolis, probably, well, I mean, aside from some storms that have come through. So just in terms of like the, you know, survivability of the whole thing, like weather is obviously a big part of it. And you told us about the storm that you you were going up to Baltimore. Any other crazy storm stories? Yeah, especially here on the East Coast. We get hit with nor'easterns here every once in a while. This year we got one. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't the worst one that we've gotten here, but it's still something that you have to prepare for. So, and that's kind of going back to you always have to be planning. I, I probably check the weather. I don't know every day. I get on windy and see what the wind's doing. Uh, I look, you know, at the forecast and see what's coming up, coming my way. And if there's a nasty storm coming in, unless I want to be up at one o'clock in the morning, running around in the rain, checking my lines and adding extra lines, tying off. That's something you want to prepare for in advance. You know, this last, we had one pretty good storm. I think it was blowing, I want to say we were getting up to 60 knots. And I went out a couple of days before I knew it was coming. And I tied off my mainsail real good. I wrapped it, took my dodger off, made sure that the head cell was really secure and doubled up all my lines. It's just to, in case one of them were to break. So, you know, that stuff, I mean, in a house, you just shut the door and but do you enjoy Maybe bring storms? In. Another uh, favorite part of my marine experience. Do you enjoy storms? No, I don't love the storms, to be honest. I think it's a little different on a, on a sailboat versus a powerboat. So on a sailboat during storms, even the, the best rigged mast, you'll, you'll get what's called mast pumping. And I don't love the way that feels. It kind of shakes the and boat. So what does mast pumping do? The whole mast is like moving side to side and... It's like a resonance Not so almost. much side to side. You know what you mean? Yeah, it resonates. It's almost like a harmonic. So the, the wind will come across the mass and cause kind of like a... Some boats actually will get a vibration and you can actually hear the, the mass like humming hmm. and it can get quite loud. I think that's usually the case if your your rigging is not tuned right. But all boats will get some sort of mast pump and that's... Yeah, the mass will get... It'll start vibrating at a certain frequency and it'll actually start pumping back and forth. And you can feel it shake on the boat. And right now, my mast, which this is an upcoming project I have to do, is the the wires that are run internally in my mast aren't secure. Mm. So I can hear the, the wires kind of <laughs> slapping against the side of the mast. Eventually, mm. you don't really hear it, kind of like any other, anything else in life. Like, you hear it enough, and your brain just kind of tunes it out after a while. But during a good storm, you definitely hear it. And, you know, if you don't tie your halyards off, you know, they'll start slapping against the mass that you definitely hear and all your neighbors hear that too so those of you boaters that are out there listening tie your halyards off if you have a good storm nice out to out. everyone yeah. Yeah. nobody wants to hear that slapping all night long yeah when the the wind comes screaming through the marina and it hits the the rigging of all the other sailboats there and it makes like this weird scream and you know i'd be sitting on my boat and it sounds like you can hear like people whispering 
wind just going through and you know it howls yeah whispers of my name i'm like what the hell's going on you know spooky yeah and it's a trip like i mean so some of the old timers one of the old timers that i raced with he he said he was telling me a few years ago we had a it was a nor'easter and that was so big that the the water got within about one inch from the top of the pylons and that was like holy crap like what what the hell do you do then like that's when lines start coming off and boats just start floating around the marina that's my biggest fear and i've thought kind of back and forth about that if i think maybe if there was a big enough storm coming through i would probably i might leave the marina and find a a little cove somewhere and just drop out a couple anchors and a big storm anchor that way i'm away from other boats you're gonna have to be at anchor in a storm at some point, especially if, if you plan on doing what I plan on doing. Mm. My biggest fear is not what my boat's going to do because I'll, I'll make sure that it's not going to move. My fear is what other boats are going to do to my boat mm. because I, I've seen some of the rigging. I've seen some of the dock lines on some of these boats and it's like, I don't know how they stay attached under calm conditions. And so how big a storm would warrant you leaving the dock? Now, I think if we were getting upwards in 80 knots, yeah. I might try to Head, head, head some place where interesting yeah I, I would try to find some place where it's not blowing that hard and find mm-hmm. an, a safe little cove so then in keeping all of this in mind any sort of pro tip with uh, weather safety perhaps uh, have a good storm anchor and learn how to drop more than one anchor i mean a lot of people think you just put one anchor out and you're good mm-hmm. during a good hurricane you should have at least two mm-hmm. and you take the second Something one out put, on like a dinghy or so you put one off your bow and one off your stern and you would so you you look at what direction the wind is coming from and try to line your boat up with the direction of that wind. So if you won the lottery, right? You won ten million dollars. What would you do with it? Would you buy a, another boat or put a ton of money into the boat you got? What would you do? Ten million dollars, I'd do both. Um, <laughs> I don't, so what? I don't see boat? my. Boat. I don't see myself ever selling this boat. Sailing is then like getting rid of it. This is one of my forever boats. I kind of think of this as my Atlantic boat because I think it's perfect for sailing around the Atlantic, the Med. I do want another boat though. I want a Pacific boat because that's a whole different beat. <laughs> and that would be, that. I'd love to get like a, I don't know, 45 foot all steel sailboat and maybe take that guy down to the, the, the Antarctic. That's what I was asking. What sort of expeditions can you do with that one? Yeah, um, that's like unlimited on a good steel sailboat. I mean, you could go around the horn with that thing. So what sort of gear do you recommend? Just maybe even on a day-to-day basis, small things people forget or you know, must-haves perhaps? It depends on your lifestyle, really. Like as far as safety, I, you know, I think we've probably touched on that. I mean, if you're going to do long voyages, you should probably have a life raft especially if you plan on crossing some oceans. I mean, it's not a must, but it sure is nice. And I guess it would depend on how big the ocean is that you're crossing. And it's also useful if you're just sort of anchoring off somewhere, you can just dinghy into town and get... Well, yeah, I'm talking about about an actual life raft versus a dinghy, though. See what you mean, okay. A dinghy is a must. Like, if you go on anywhere and you're where you want to anchor out, you got to have a dinghy. That's kind of like living on land and not owning a car. Mm. Like, it's pretty tough. You can do it, but there's not and this. I guess there are some places where you can get a, a water taxi. I, I don't know mm. if that's everywhere, but it's kind of mm. like having, yeah, it's, it's your car. It's how you go get groceries. It's how you go do laundry. So if you could do it all over again with all the knowledge that you have, how would you have done it differently? You know, whether it be buying the boat or the projects or what have you. I don't think I would have done anything differently. I might have started someplace else, maybe further south. I love the people here in Norfolk as far as who are my neighbors, but the area itself I'm not in love with. It's not, I mean, I don't know. Some people say that the, the bay is one of the best places in the world to sail. I kind of disagree after have, having sailed it for a couple of years now. The weather's not always that great. It's <laughs> You have maybe four or five months out of the year where you can go out and enjoy sailing. The rest of the time, it's usually raining or stormy or the, you know, there's a lot of, a whole lot of marine traffic, big traffic that comes in and out, especially near where I'm at. So, you know, that caused a lot of chop, uh, which isn't usually that fun to sail around in. Like we don't really get big swells here in the Bay. We just get a lot of chop. So yeah, I, I might have started further south. What type of people have you met since you've been living on a boat? People like me. 
I think I, I touched on it earlier where liveaboards are a special breed. They're, they're introverts and they're extroverts at the same time. There's two types of boaters. Actually, I'd say there's, I guess, four types. So there's two types in terms of liveaboard and non-liveaboard. And then there's two types in terms of sailing and powerboating. And everybody mm. has kind of their own vibe. I think mm. liveaboard powerboaters are more similar to liveaboard sailors just because we share that liveaboard aspect. But for pleasure crafts, like just weekend sailors, power boaters and sailors are, are drastically different. Hmm. What do you mean? How, what are some of the similarities and differences you're talking about? So as far as similarities, little boards, yeah, we all, I think we're all kind of going after the same lifestyle. We're all minimalists because we just really can't fit that much in our home. And that, I think, generally appeals to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't live on a boat. And then we like to get away from normal society. I don't know about everybody else, but most of the people I meet, they like to be on their boat. You know, we'll go out and we'll do things on land, but we really enjoy going back to our boat and being on the water. <laughs> There's seclusion to it. Okay. And then you said there was also a difference between power boaters and, and sail boaters. And what sort of distinction is that? I, I think the main distinction would be speed. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, it's kinda like that, yeah, it's kind of like somebody that owns like a, an old classic cruiser versus somebody that owns a souped up hot rod. Very, very different type of people. They both enjoy cars, but what they want to do with that car is completely different. One of them wants to go as fast as they possibly can. The other one just enjoys restoring the car and cruising around in it. That's very similar with power boaters versus sailors. A sailor enjoys working on his boat to make it look beautiful, bring it back to its glory, and likes going out, putting around at five miles per hour on the bay mm. or on the water. A power boater wants to put the biggest engines he can get on that sucker and get out there and rip around all day. True. So you're telling me that you're going to be, you know, you're cool with just being a sailor. You don't want to shift over to power boats at some point? I have yet to find the appeal for me of power boating. Maybe we should go out. I, I, can, I, <laughs> I know, tell us like what? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some restrictions that I don't want with power boating. The expense is well, one. That that's a big one for me. It's just the fuel is it's just costs so much, and I and I'm yeah. sure. And that is your limitation as well in terms of uh, how far you can go as well. Yeah, how far you can go. Can you ever truly get off? Be off grid on a power boat? Now I, I know. I, I think even with Utah, people are doing electrical conversions mm -hmm. and running them off solar, and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Coming I, around, I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I don't ever have to have a motor if I don't really want to. It just depends on how slow I'm willing to go mm. or how long I'm willing to just bob out there in the middle of nowhere. That's what I love about sailing. It's essentially free. Like if you have a water maker and you got a fishing pole, you can kind of live out on the water forever if you really want to. So, Andrew, we're getting close to the end. Tell us a little bit. We didn't talk too much about your uh, racing adventures. Like, how did you get into that? I mean, from a person who never sailed, uh, you're racing sailboats now. What does that mean? I actually got into that when I, when I was, when I first got the boat and I was on the hard, I met another guy that was working on his boat right next to mine. You know, we got to be friends and he said, you know, I, I got a buddy who's owns a Pearson, like my boat, a little bit newer, a little bit smaller. He said, he, he races it. Are you, you interested? And I was like, I'm interested in every chance I can get to get on the water. I don't care what I'm doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm interested. So I said, okay. And so he introduced me to the guy, this guy, Rudy. And he said, yeah, we race every Wednesday night during the, the sailing seasons of the year. And he said, come along. You, I'll try you out if you seem like a good fit. You can, you can keep racing with us. So I went out. Yeah, we, we all hit it off. It's a great crew consider them good friends now and we got every wednesday night and we race in the it's the little creek selling association so how many boats are we talking fleet. about yeah usually there's a fleet uh it ranges from you know 15 to 20 boats usually at a time from i'd say 30 feet upwards of 40 and we do a it's usually about a three-hour race every wednesday night the course always changes and we go out there and we just dominate every time. And is it a rain or shine sort of deal? Yeah, the only limitation is if it's blowing uh, 20 knots or greater, then they cancel the race. And that's don't just... you scale boaters? Isn't that what you like? You're like, yeah, more wind. Yeah, yeah, we do. But yeah, I think it's <laughs> more in the sense. I yeah. think it's more in the sense of a 40 foot boat can handle 20 knots, no problem. 
Mm. Uh, a 30 foot boat, not so much. So it becomes more of a, well, that's not very fair. Like I physically can't go out there without tearing up my boat. So I lost this rate because your boat is capable. So mm-hmm. that's more of why they do it. But it, it, yeah, it's a blast, man. Like there's been times where it's blowing like the devil out there and we're just ripping along at eight, nine knots. And there's also been times where in the middle of the race, the wind will just completely disappear. But I remember, so one race we were out there about halfway through the course and the wind just stopped and the tide was coming in. So all the boats started drifting backwards. So to not lose ground, because you're in a race, you don't want to lose ground. Everybody starts throwing out their anchors, <laughs> stop the boat from drifting backwards. And then it just turned into a big, everybody jumped in the water and it was just a big swim party. It was, it was a blast, but it's complete insanity out there. I mean, I saw five or six boat collisions last season. Oh boy. In the race. Yeah. A couple of them, T-Bone hit them broadside. One of them it was actually the last race of the season. And uh, one boat T-Boned another one and he his bowsprit tore the entire top of the cabin off the other boat. Holy Ouch. Shit. I mean, it was done. Totaled the boat. So it, it gets intense. I've I've been within two inches of hitting another boat out there. Wow. I mean, I was going to ask, you've obviously learned a lot. What are some of the things that like racing taught you that everyday sailing won't? How to trim sails, how to hit the optimal speed on your boat. The truth of the matter is anybody can learn to sail. It's not even that difficult. Put your sails up, point it in a direction and figure out if you're going forward or not. Sailing is pretty easy. Sailing good and knowing how to sail your boat to its full potential is extremely hard. That takes a lifetime of sailing to learn. So we've got last few questions, Andrew. So one is the for you for water heat. Is it cheaper to live on a boat? I think we can sort of close with that and the sort of apps, websites you recommend. These can sort of go hand to hand. They're all going to sort of lead into each other, basically. But yeah. this five tip, do you want to just end with that? I don't know. Up to you. I feel like we've done a ton of tips throughout we've this. We've done so many tips, dude. Um, and you sort of mentioned your water and your heat. Do you want to go in there again? So the age old question about owning a boat and living on it is... Is it actually cheaper to live on a boat? So what, what's your regard on that? So for me, yes, kind of. I guess, so it depends on, on what, you're, what you want to do on the boat uh, or your lifestyle in general. If you want a brand new, beautiful boat, yeah, it's, that's quarter million dollars off the bat. If you want to live in a marina everywhere you go, you know, like I think I mentioned down in Florida, you know, marinas can run over a thousand dollars a month to stay at. In that sense, it's a lot more expensive to live on a boat. For me right now, I'd say it's about even, but that's only because I throw everything I earn into my boat right now. I'm, I'm fixing it up to be 100% how I want it, which is not cheap. There's a lot of big ticket items to buy, but in the long run for me, it's absolutely cheaper. It's mm. almost free. Especially if you can get off grid the way you want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, once I get to that point, all I've got to buy is a little bit of fuel for the dinghy and food. Mm. That's it. No, Everything no, else. Huh? Yeah, do you fish? Do you fish? Uh, have you fished? How, what's your fishing experience? Yeah, I fished. So I've always grown up freshwater fishing. And I'm, I fancy myself a pretty good freshwater fisherman. I've done it my whole life. So I, I can catch. I have attempted saltwater fishing a couple times in life. Uh, one was just out on a charter where everybody catches something because you're with a captain that knows where to plop a boat down where you're going to catch a fish. Also done some freshwater fishing here in the bay. Tala. Saltwater. Yeah. yeah. Huh? We, we, Salt went, we went on a, a tog we went on a tournament, right? Yeah. yeah. A taw tog fishing tor- tournament. And that's when I learned that I do not know how to fish for salt water. Because <laughs> <laughs> yep. we didn't catch a thing. It's it's a tricky beast. Uh, There's definitely you, something we were missing. If you go into it like I did, where you think, yeah, I, I've been freshwater fishing my whole life. I'll go out mm. there, and no problem. Mm. It's not the same. It's completely different. The fish are different. What they eat is different. The little tricks you got to do. It, it's Every fish, it seems like, has its own little trick to catching it. For us that day, we were fishing, trying to catch a tog and... So a couple people that I know that have fresh fished the bay their whole lives were like giving me tips on how to catch Tata. You know, drop your your lure, let it hit the bottom, and just bounce it across the bottom. They live in the rocks down there. 
Mm. So that's what I was trying. I still didn't have any luck, but I, I get the sense that every every saltwater fish kind of has its own unique little trick, mm. and you have to learn all those tricks. And even then, it takes a lifetime of right. or a long time of, yeah. of doing it. Because why yeah. we didn't catch anything, every, most everybody else that had been fishing the bay their whole life came back with buckets full of fish. Yep, they knew exactly what to do and how to do it. Yeah. And they were in the same yeah. spots we were. Yep, and we were in the same spots. So then, so as, on a final note, then just as a final tip, you've given us so many tips, but mm-hmm. what are maybe your favorite apps or websites that, you know, just make this whole thing much more doable? So for me, some of the main websites I frequent right now, and that's because I'm in total boat renovation mode, is sites like Defender. For all I rigging, I used uh, riggingonly.com. They had great prices and great products. I just got into a site called Mora Pro that uh, I, I've been replacing all my, my running rigging, and their prices are good, and their equipment is good. So those are the, my main go-tos. I still watch Selling Uma religiously because mm. we got the same boat, and I, I just think what they're doing is fantastic. I think they're one of the, the true sailor selling sell, sell boat YouTube channels out there. They're doing stuff that nobody else is doing, and I, I kind of feed off. Their passion is equal to my passion. So those are the main ones. And then for, like, weather, what's your favorite weather app? So I use Wendy a lot, but with Wendy... I've learned to add about five knots to whatever they say because usually the wind's blowing a little bit more. I love Navionics. I just haven't started paying for it yet, and I should because it's fantastic. Some of the other ones I use, let me check here. I use an app called Marine Traffic a lot. Mm, that's that like, Marine Traffic will show you other boats that have their AIS turned on, which is important, especially when you're sailing in the, at night or when so back it was i think it was january i went for a day sail and it was the fog was thick thick i mean you couldn't see 20 feet in front of the boat and we're you know sailing through the bay up to hampton crossing channels so i was the only one that had marine traffic turned on and i'm watching other boats out there that had their ais on and i see well there's a big container ship like crossing the channel right in front of us Mm. and about as as soon as I said that, the, the captain of that ship got on the radio and called us out, you know, mm. small pleasure craft. What are your what are your intentions? And within minutes, we it, I mean, it, there was it looked like a 20 story building, like 50 feet in front of us. Wow. That is a must have app if you don't have AIS on your your boat already. So, yeah, those those are some of the, the main ones I use. Uh, I use Noah sometimes to to watch the weather, but. They want you to pay for their app, so I don't use that a ton. Well, Andrew, it was amazing to talk to you. Uh, a ton of tips, so uh, damn good job. Hopefully, I help somebody out out there that's wanting to go this route. But uh, best tip: make sure it's an obsession. <laughs> yeah, get into it if you love it. I agree with yeah. that. If you don't have to live on a boat, you can enjoy sailing around. But if you're going to live on it, be obsessed with it because it's going to take every bit of it. We we'll really appreciate it. And we hope to have you back on the show, perhaps in the future. And thank you so much for everything that you shared with us. And good luck. Yeah, I loved it. Thanks, guys, for having me. Check back every Tuesday for our latest episode. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe to ShipShape.pro.